So today we are chatting with Jamal Joseph about his career and his new book, Black Boys Dance 2. Uh, Jamal is an artist currently based in Los Angeles, California. He has had an extensive career working with artists such as JLo on NBC's Season 1 World of Dance, uh, the BET Awards in 2019, um, and choreography for America's Got Talent Season 15, Divas and Drummers of Compton, just to name a few. His biggest accomplishment to date has been his choreography uh, for Beyonce's iconic performance at Coachella in 2018. So hi, Jamal, and welcome. How are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Um, okay. We're excited to sit down and chat with you about your new book. Um, yes. We had a chance to read it, and I think it's really fantastic uh, to be out there for, for young kids to read. Thank you so um, much. So can we start off, can you share a little bit um, about you and how you discovered dance and your dance training? Um, so I discovered dance, um, it was very young. Uh, I, you know, just a dance team that was at my church. And um, I, there was a big gospel artist, he was doing a show and he asked us to dance background. And so that was kind of like my first professional job. And that's where I really discovered dance and to the fact that I loved it I was it was very interesting that my first time dancing in public was in front of like 7,000 people <laughs> so it was wow, uh, that's quite the introduction yeah that was like there but it was so crazy all the lights and everything was flashing and I was like oh my god this is so cool you know you're young and so um that was my introduction to dance and then um Training wise, I I naturally just kind of trained myself at first. I, I thought that, I don't know, I, was, I, I thought like if you can imitate someone, then it's just imitation to me. So it wasn't really, I was like, okay, pay attention to the detail of what this person is doing. And so a lot of it was like self-training and people thought, oh my God, you like, you've been training. And I was like, no, I just pay attention to detail, but it was... <laughs> A lot of detail before I started training, training, which didn't happen until I was about 18 or 19. And did you have any more structured training? Whereabouts did you train in your older years then? Um, so I was in college and there was a teacher that I had, she had done Broadway work and she had trained with, you know, under Ailey and all of these other things. And so she um, was dancing with the ballet company that was in the state um, where I was in college, which is in South Carolina. So um, someone told her that I was interested in dance. And so she would actually stay after work to give me ballet lessons. And wow. that's where I started to train. And then I would stay, like I would go to Oakland and just take classes. And um, like for the summer, I would just start taking classes. And then um, when I graduated from college, I moved to Atlanta and I was training with the Ballet Ethnic Dance Company and they started to teach me, you know, ballet, modern, and then um, moved to New York and I was training at Broadway Dance Center. Mm -hmm. And um, then I ended was up Was that in their, um, in their, they have like a three month and a six month program oh, where mm -mm. you go, this no? was just, oh, just taking no, drop in? Yeah, yeah, this is yeah. just like me just taking open classes and then um, I began teaching there. So it was kind of like I could teach and take class. And then I moved to LA. <laughs> awesome. And <laughs> now you are here where you are. Awesome. Right. All right. Um, that's so great to have a teacher that saw that like joy for dance in you and uh, yeah. to support that and really nurture it. Yeah. Um, so then what was it like for you growing up as a male dancer? I guess you started a little bit later. Were there challenges that you faced and dealt with or? Mm, I, yeah, I was, um, so I, I was singing first and then um, I think that when I really discovered that I liked dance, I would just hear things when it came to dance, which is really weird because especially in African-American culture, it's dance is what we are kind of known for at times. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm like, well, wait, that's a, 
like every cookout, every family event, like everyone's always dancing, but it's okay. But it was more so learning other styles and actually having to do different movements that people weren't able to understand. And so also to the stereotype of, you know, whatever. So I, it was definitely different, you know, girls would tell me and, you know, guys would be like, oh, you dance? Like, mm, I don't know. But then like being in Oakland, it wasn't that bad because I was born in Oakland, California. But when I moved to Texas, it was like, no um it very was, different states yes very <laughs> conservative and um so yeah I remember like this one girl she was like I don't know you, you I, I guess I, I was liking her or something and she was she was like I don't know you dance a little too good or like you dance better than me mm -hmm. I don't know so it was really weird comments I would always hear or um you know, people would tell my parents, don't let your son dance if you want to turn out this way, don't do this, don't do this. Like people gave my, my parents all these rules. Um, so a lot of people tried to block it. So growing up, it was not the easiest to to do or especially, you know, you're a kid, you want to fit in, you want to go out. And I mean, I played sports, I ran track, I swam tennis, but still like that wasn't basketball, football, like, you know, baseball. So it was still you know you're dealing with hyper masculinity and okay. stereotypes of society yeah absolutely um could you share a little bit actually i'm curious i'm gonna jump a little bit in my questions okay, that's fine. um because you you kind of touched on it a little bit of like the additional social stigmas um and mm -hmm. you write in your book specifically specifically about a young black boy, uh, Darnell. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering if you could expand a little bit on those potential, potentially additional stigmas um, that exist. You mentioned um, when you started doing styles outside of um, traditional, more African dance. Yeah. Um, could you expand on that a little? So like hip hop was cool in terms of, you know, when you think of like popping, locking, all of that stuff. Yeah. But um, most people don't really know that like hip hop is the culture and that there are sub styles of the culture. So like that even yeah. includes like voguing, whacking, like tutting, all of these different things. And so uh, it could be like, oh, you vogue like this. But there are very masculine men who, you know, at the time could vogue and like they knew whacking in different styles. So it was, when I started to say to do this professionally, I need to learn other things or to learn jazz and to learn like ballet. And it's like, you gonna put on tights? Like, I don't know. And I was like, you play football, you wear tights all the time. Or like, are you serious? So it was like very different or um, everything was like, I don't know. And I, it's very crazy because it's, it's like black people don't do that or this is gay or I don't, I, I don't know if I can be associated with you because of this until you're behind someone famous and now everyone is like, oh, I remember like I was there when I was like, you know, you get to that place and that's the way that a lot of people are with this. So it's, it's almost like if it's not culturally your dance or people, aren't expanded to the mindset like me knowing how to do a split like you know people I've I've literally had ladies you know dm me like I don't know if a man should be doing that and I'm like because I'm flexible like you know but yeah um or like parents who you know they see their kids dancing and I've seen kids like being punished like put in a corner or they can't go or they can't attend or I'm not gonna you know, take you to the class or I'm not going to sign for you to go to this convention. So, um, and it's very interesting of all, I don't want my child to turn out a certain way. And I really think that I was looking to break the stigma of the art of something doesn't make you anything, you know, um, but in a weird way, you blocking it can actually do exactly what you're trying to prevent because yeah. if 
that person, if, if someone of another lifestyle embraces, then your child is going to feel like, well, these are the only people who are embracing and accepting what I like to do. So this must make me this way. And so it was very tough to, to have that conversation with a lot of people, um, especially in terms of the African-American culture, just because a lot of it is like based on Bible and bi what's biblical and all of these other things that kind of get into it when it comes to politics and church. And I was like, oh my God, so it's, it's a lot. I There's mean, it's so just, many it's just, extra yeah. interlocking factors in that. Yeah, yeah, like it's just dance, like, you know, come on. So, but until the popular person, like, you know, if we see a LeBron or Steph Curry take a ballet class, I'm sure every boy, oh man, like I'm trying to be like LeBron, man. Like he took it and it's like, okay. He takes it, they, then it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. It's more so about followers and less about being different. And it's very hard, you know, in our world to be different a new trend comes out a new challenge a new tiktok everybody has to do it because i have to be with the times so representation is super important yeah yeah uh could you expand a little bit about on that aspect of it all and how ensuring that you are present and there to be an example for young boys and anybody who wants to dance now can can draw people out of their shells or make it seem like it's, or make it, yeah, seem like it's acceptable to, to pursue dance in the arts? Well, I think that the first thing is that people knowing historically what, where dance comes from and then knowing what dance does to your body in terms of our bodies that we carry pain, we carry trauma, we carry so many things. And your muscles carry that. So being able to move your body is something that just releases all of that. That's the first thing. And then I think that representation is very important because um, I just think that we have so many gifted people and so much talent and the fear of someone saying anything shouldn't really stop that. But yeah. knowing that dance isn't just this style or this or this, like dance is really, really big. And I tell people, dance is even a MacBook commercial where they're sitting there and they're opening up the computers and they're like passing and stuff. Dance is your natural, you're walking every day. And then yeah. you like, it's, it's so many simple things. It's just what you do to make it move and to express. So, um, it's a language. And I think that the representation of um, men is always important for men to see and to be able to express or to have that softer side. Um, because hyper masculinity is just toxic, <laughs> to be it's honest. Incredibly it's incredibly toxic. It's just yeah. really, really toxic. And I was actually having a conversation about this last night. I was like, I want more men to stand up because despite men being in control of our whole societal everything, the people who break the barriers are women. And not that I was like, I'm not being, I think that that's amazing because I think that women have more opposition than men. But if we're gonna say like Black Lives Matter, like we have to be able to support the mental and emotional side of that too. So that means that our boys who aren't as hyper masculine and our women, we should be able to be alongside of them and to be able to help get their voice out there and to help be a voice together. So um, just the tenacity and the unity is so important for like the representation of A, our culture and then the art of dance. Um, I think that the more you see it, it can probably, you know, get it back in school systems and get it back as, you know, get more funding and people can appreciate it more, um, just having more knowledge. Absolutely. It, the toxic masculinity that exists and surrounds so much of, of dance and everything in our mm -hmm. society, we need to recognize that it affects everybody and ensure that Sure. To come together to, to do that. yeah create that change for sure um i'm going to 
jump back now. Could you share a little bit about what your career is like now? Your resume is incredibly impressive. Um, and just expand a little bit, I guess, on the introduction <laughs> that we gave you. Uh, um, expand on which one? What <laughs> is a day like for you? Sorry. <laughs> Oh, well, a day for me is I get up, I walk my dog, who's literally sitting right here by me, um, oh, and God. then I, you know, I'll work out, or it depends, like, every day is different. Um, it depends on which artist you're working with at the time, it depends on which project. Um, sometimes I'll have rehearsals, sometimes I'll, you know... I've had friends come over and be like, you know, give me a ballet warm up, give me a tap warm up, or every day is different. Some days I'll just be like, I'm I'm gonna wake up and I'm gonna play tennis for a few hours or something. Like it's all different. I make my own schedule. Um, and but if I am working with an artist, then it's a little bit more intense. So I'm normally gonna be with them no more than no less than four hours. So that's a lot of teaching and training and dancing and choreographing. And um, even with choreographing, normally you are a sense of a creative director. So, you know, you're picking out lighting and the way you like, can you move in this? And like all of the things like, what's the camera angles and stuff. Um, so it can be a lot of business in terms of me doing pitch decks and, um, like proposals and stuff like that so it's it's quite a bit it's never just dancing <laughs> yeah it's never, never like just, just one dance. job like, that's the easy part <laughs> yeah it's all the other work that's associated yeah. with it um all right so then this is a shift in a creative medium you've moved from the studio over to writing a book um so what drove you to write a book and why specifically a children's book? Um, so what did it for me was, um, A, just saying that there was a lot of younger boys who um, have dreams like working on America's Got Talent or even working with Beyonce or when I did the BT Awards and stuff. Like there were people who were having their they would reach out to me and they had dreams or aspirations, but just to hear their stories or to hear that thing, like just to hear so much, I was like, wow, like, okay, like, let's just open up the conversation. It's a pandemic. And I've always said I was going to do this and now I actually have the time to do it. So um, <laughs> then um, I'm a big kid. So I pretty much watch anything, Disney, anime, all of this stuff. So I was like, oh my God, like, this would be cool. Like as a, as a movie. So literally when I watch movies everything is like based on this novel based on this book so I was like well I want to do a film so I should do a book first and I was like then it's easier to like pitch so my initial thought was I wanted to do a short film animation so do a book first and that was the route I took basically nice. and then it That's turned short. into oh. yeah but then it turned into like I guess when it was done um it turned into me realizing how much of my subconscious works because yeah. the character like kind of looks like me as a child or there were things that I kind of went through as a child that I don't think I ever really unpacked. I think I just said, oh, this life and that's the way people are going to be. And I kind of kept moving. Um, so I had to revisit a lot of areas. So I think that it, kind of backfired a little bit and then made me deal with some things. I think that's so important though, because art is a form of, or a way for us to look internally and, yeah. oh, we, oh, sorry, I thought you froze. Um, <laughs> a way to look internally and to um, take stock of what we've experienced and process that. And so, yeah, even if something as seemingly simple as a children's book can it hold mm -hmm. so many lessons for us. Yeah. Yeah, Disney has all the lessons. I learned so much I know. from Pixar. <laughs> I feel like I, I watch a Disney movie now, and I'm like, I you it's like watching a completely different movie as an adult right. versus when you yes. watch it as a child. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, 
so can you tell us a little bit about the book and uh, who Darnell is and what his story is? So Darnell is a little kid who was super excited. And, you know, when you're a child, you're really excited about going to school. You have new school supplies, your new crayons and everything. And it just you get to make new friends. And by the time you get to seventh grade, you don't want to go to school anymore. Um, and you're like, I still want summertime. But as a kid, something excites you about school. I don't know what it is, but um, he's really excited. And he is getting to his first day of school and the teacher is expressing, you know, hey, you know, what do you guys like to do for fun? And he starts to see that the world that he lives in isn't what the world outside sees him as. And that becomes a big struggle because something that he felt he does every day and loves, he never thought that he would be bullied or antagonized for. Um, so it's a small journey of this kid who is, interestingly enough, at a very young age, trying to find where he fits in, like, what is love? Why are people like this? Like, it's so many things of a self-discovery. Um, and he finds friends along the way to help him, you know, to help support his, the beginning of his journey of a, of a long life. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, I want to touch on a couple or one th one scene in particular in the book um, that kind of st stuck out to me. And I think that this comes back to the beginning of our conversation about adults and the role that they play in, in the impact on our lives. And um, there's, he shares with the class that he likes to dance. Um, and one of the kids shouts that dancing is for girls and boys don't swirl and twirl. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought it was interesting because children are so shaped around about shaped by the world around them. Um, and of course, particularly by their parents and then the adults that, that are in their lives. Um, and so this section wasn't just, I think a teaching moment for kids, but a chance for adults to take pause and consider how their words and actions have an impact. Um, so yeah, could kids you are sponges. A little... <laughs> Kids yeah, are kids are sponges. Like they just absorb everything. You say something, and then three weeks later, right. you've completely forgotten about it, and they remember right. and it was like yes. two seconds. Right, um, everything. And so, could you expand a little? I'm not sure if this is where you were going with this section, um, but like how kids learn what's deemed acceptable in society. Um. So, in a weird way, um. I guess like I've been learning a lot by my dog. Um, I'm looking at, not say they're like children to dogs, but um, <laughs> I'm looking at my dog who I got when he was eight weeks and he doesn't know anything. Like he barely, he sees me as this parent because for some, for the first amount of my time with him or his time with me, all he knows is what I have given him. He knows that I'm going to eat about this time. I know that I need to see this. So I've been looking at the nonverbal communication of when he wants to do something. If he needs to go to the bathroom, he's going to go sit by the door. Or if he's hungry, he's going to come and kind of like rub on you. And so it's the same for a kid. If they're crying, you know, okay, maybe you have gas or you need to eat or you're like, you start to learn what is the nonverbals in it. But so much of after that is verbal. Um, so when I listen to it, a lot of things that traumatize kids at a young age are things that are often said because you don't understand nonverbal communication yet. Only thing you understand is what you hear and what you see mostly you are taught your five senses so you think that that's the whole world like I see this I think so um you know and it's very interesting because even when you see little kids I've seen like memes and stuff like kids um you know they've done like twin day or something at school and so then you'll see like uh, a Caucasian student and like a black kid and they're like 
you know, this is my twin. And they don't see, they don't even see color yet unless it's yeah. taught to them. So um, a lot of things, you know, especially unfortunately, because a lot of parents, you know, some kids, some people have kids young and they have kids, you know, 20, 19, and they have, they're, they're at a certain level of maturity as well. So what they pass down to their children is different, you know, and I've, I've sat and I've heard parents be like, uh, uh-uh, not in my house. Like, don't, nope, don't do that. Like, all you know is no, why, you know, and so a lot of kids go off of what they hear. And in a weird way, even when we're asleep, we can hear what's being said. We don't know why. Like, you know, you, you, you're sleeping and then what is being said or being heard can be in your dream. So yeah. it, it's all very in tune with what do you hear? Um, so I think that kids only repeat what they hear and then what they see on TV. And so it's like social media and everything else. So it's like, I don't know it, but all I know is that that's what was said and that's who I like and that's who I look up to. So this must be right. Um, it it does have a lot to do with someone, someone told this girl that that is what happened or she saw this being said to another boy or her brother or something. So um, all they do is go to school and repeat it. Yeah. And that's why it's important that we have teachers and parents like the ones that Darnell has to yeah. uh, share that it is all good to pursue dance or whatever it is that makes you happy. Yes. Um, and that comes back to our other question about representation in dance and the arts. Um, mm-hmm. We've come a full circle there. Yeah. Um, what would you say to young dancers who aren't feeling welcome in dance or supported in their dreams? Um, well, what I would say for sure is that your surrounding area is a very small, like, just mental area of where your mind can go. There's a whole world of people who explore and who love the art and who you will connect with at one point in life. So just because the people that you see in your peripheral don't like it, there are plenty of people out there who will love it. So um, don't worry about the one person that's next to you because there's millions of people out there who will welcome you with open arms and love everything about what you have to give to the world. And just don't let anyone dim your light. Like we are born with passions, gifts, visions, to inspire, to change the world, to plant a seed for the next generation. And so um, you're just doing what you were given. Such an important message. Thank you. For Canada's Ballet Jorgen is launching our Boys in Dance campaign to abolish stigmas and stereotypes associated with boys in dance. We'll be kicking it off shortly with a contest to win a copy of Jamal's book, so stay tuned for this exciting contest. Yeah. Awesome. Yay. Um, so.